Hi, I'm Laura Waters. I'm proud to present at the Explorers Club tonight. I'm going to be talking about a journey I did about four years ago, hiking from one end of New Zealand to the other, which is a 3,000 kilometre journey over five months. Um, it was a bit of a life-changing journey for me. There's a lot of challenges to overcome, uh, a lot of unbridged river crossings and high mountains and all sorts of exciting things happened. But it was a trip that fundamentally changed the course of my life and it was a fantastic adventure. I'm going to talk about the physical journey but also the internal journey because you don't do, you don't spend sort of five months out in the wilds and not have it change you in some way. Um, so when I became aware of this trek, I'd been working for eight years as an executive assistant to a CEO in Melbourne and um, I'd always been looking for an adventure just in the back of my mind I was thinking surely there must be more to life, I can do more than this and I was reading a ma hiking magazine about this new trail that had just opened, Te Araroa and it goes, oh wait a minute, what's happening there, um, from the very top of New Zealand all the way down to the bottom, it sort of links up, it opened in late uh, 2011 links up a lot of pre-existing wilderness trails and then there's some backcountry roads and some other miscellaneous bits um, yeah so I knew there were going to be a lot of challenges on this um, walk New Zealand's not the easiest play to walk place to walk and I ordered the guidebook and it had scary phrases in it like this in places it's a hand over hand descent, but without exposure in the mountaineering sense of hanging out over a drop. And I was like, hmm, what does that mean exactly? Um, so that was a bit freaky. And if you know anything about contour lines, um, this is steep. These contour lines are so close together, they're almost touching. So, and I knew there was gonna be a lot of unbridged river crossings as well. So I was kind of freaking out about the whole thing and not feeling very confident about it. So. Enter my friend Belle, and um, I coerced a girlfriend to come with me because I thought, well, we can, we can share this challenge together. So just to give you a little bit of backstory, before I did this trip, I wasn't in an amazing headspace. I was feeling really overwhelmed by all of the, the noise and the constant stimulation that you get in the city. You know, social media, the busyness on tr on public transport and, and um, advertising and media, it was just all really overwhelming. So this trip couldn't have come at a better time for me to escape out into the wilds. So here we are in our matching packs. <laughs> um, so this was November in 2013. So we're starting in the North Island in spring. And the idea was to get to the bottom of the South Island before winter really kicked in. So we started out on a glorious day and ahead of us was 100 kilometres of beach. This is the first section, just 100 kilometres of beach. And uh, on the first afternoon, my girlfriend started limping. <laughs> and <laughs> the next morning she's like, I think I need to go and sort this out. I can't keep walking. So off I went on my first ever solo overnight hike and my first ever hike over 65 kilometres. All I'd done before was the overland track in Tassie and this first, first section was 100 k's. Uh, so my girlfriend said, I'm going to go back to town and see a doctor and I'll meet you at the other end. And so I was like, okay. And it's a really long beach. <laughs> it's just, this is your view for four days. And, you know, I'd heard from a lot of, a few other hikers who had gone before me um, that, you know, oh, the sand's too hard, it's too soft, it's boring. But I loved it. I, you know, especially after what I was dealing with in Melbourne, to have all of this space and all I could hear was that. Yeah. and the birds and I found all these little discoveries and just beauty everywhere and I loved having all of that space to myself as well so yeah as I say it was just me and and the waves I could set my tent up wherever I felt you know there was there was no rules out there there's nothing to say this is the end of your day this is where you camp so I just gathered water from streams and had the time of my life. So in four and a half days, I walked the first 400 k's and I rendezvoused with my friend and she said, yeah, 
I'm still not still not great. I think I'll I think I'll fly home and see my usual doctor. And I was like, oh, okay. So um, she said, but I'll I'll come back. And um, I did the next section, which was from the west coast across the northern forest to the east coast, past a lot of big cowrie trees. And by chance, I bumped into two other hikers um, who were also attempting the trek. So for that section I walked with them and it's really dense forest there it's very slippery and muddy and uh, you know I really that the leaves clattered when you when you brushed past them and I really almost expected to come across David Attenborough and a bunch of gorillas <laughs> there it was that kind of forest if you know what I mean and I, I don't know if you can grasp the steepness of it here but there's my friend trying to reach down for some for some solid ground so it's really challenging hiking. Can I and ask you where you how you know where the tra trail is? Yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes you don't. <laughs> um, we had you can download all the maps and trail notes off off the website, but it's not very well marked. I mean, in this section, sometimes you don't see the track. You just kind of sense: does this feel right or does it not? But yeah, it's a bit of a challenge at times. So. Um, in that, I was doing it in the second, third season of this trail of being officially open and maybe about a hundred people attempted it that season but because of the weather window a lot of people are sort of leaving at the same time so at this point I met a few other hikers that we would sort of pass and leapfrog and we'd walk together and then we wouldn't so this, this is a sort of the group that I sort of leapfrogged you know, throughout the length of New Zealand. Now those first three weeks were pretty tough. Um, everything hurt, I had blisters, my body hurt just lying down even. Um, and I thought, I never thought about giving up, but I did think oh, I might have a miserable five months ahead of me. Now, in the Northern Forest, it's so steep and the tracks are so eroded sometimes, it's just easier to walk in the river itself. And sometimes you might be doing that for a couple of hours at a time and you know from ankle deep up to thigh deep but it's infinitely better than trying to drag yourself over tree trunks and slippery off camber tracks the trail has been designed as a cultural natural and historical trail of the country so it's not just all backcountry trails sometimes you're doing these um you know gravel roads and going past farms and you know meeting the people in the country which is which is great and before I went to do this trip, when I think of New Zealand, I thought of big snow-covered mountains and, you know, gnarly, gnarly hills. But there's also these beautiful little coastal settlements as well. And it was in one of these coastal spots about 300 kilometres in that I finally got the email from my friend saying she wasn't coming back. <laughs> and so, although I wasn't physically on my own, I was you know, emotionally on my own. And I never knew if the people with me were going to stick with me or they were going to skip bits or drop out. So from there on, I had to sort of put on my big girl pants and push on. <laughs> but uh, on this particular day, I knew there were some friends ahead of me and I thought, if I can walk 40 kilometres in a day, I'll catch up with them. And before I started this trip, I'd heard of other people doing 40 kilometre days and I was like, Pfft. That is ridiculous. I will not be doing that. Thank you. And then I did it. And it wasn't that bad. You know, get used to it. So I caught up with my buddies. And there's a lot of estuaries to cross in the north, um, in the North Island that lead out to the sea. And sometimes the waterways are a little bit bigger than an estuary. And th this is a segment from the actual trail notes. You have to hitchhike on a boat. Just convince some fishermen to take you across. So I met up with two other guys, an American and a Kiwi, and they invited me to walk with them all the way to Auckland. So I thought, yes, I've got company. I'll be safe. So a lot of lovely beach walking, some volcanic forests, and some muddy cowrie forests. And eventually, we made it to Auckland. And by this time, my body's starting to get used to it. You know, the, the cankles have subsided and my body's feeling pretty strong and I thought, you know, I mean that sort of distance is far beyond anything I'd done before so it was pretty cool to get there. 
But I have to say, it was a bit of a shock to the system to be back in the city again. It took me, you know, four, four or five weeks to get to Auckland. And suddenly I was surrounded by busy cars and traffic and people and the buildings just hummed. You don't realise it until you get away from it for a while. And you go and stay in a hotel and it's like, mm, this humming going on. But mo most alarming was the change in my inner monologue. Because, you know, gone was... with. With the loss of my peaceful environment came the loss of my peaceful mind and you know people would be walking in front of me on the pavement on the phone i'd be like get out of the way you you know <laughs> and i was like whoa who said that you know and it's just that's a voice that sort of follows me a lot in the city but when i'm out in nature it's it's nice and peaceful out there so i had spent about four days in auckland i had 60 odd kilometers to walk across Greater Auckland and I just did it in a bunch of day hikes without my pack. And I was feeling pretty nervous about pushing on on my own beyond that. And at the 11th hour I got an invitation from two other guys to, to walk with them for a bit. So I was uh, relieved again to have company. I'll just talk a bit about camping. In the North Island um, most of the time you're just camping in a tent. Uh, in the South Island, there's a lot of huts, which is cool. Uh, but in the North Island, you're just trying to grab whatever land you can. And sometimes you, you know, get a fantastic spot like this. And other times you, you're just in some logging wasteland. But uh, you make do with what you can. Sometimes you end up in a sculpture park at the base of a power station. But, um, yeah, and then other times you get a kind invite by the, by the locals that you just meet along the way. Um, I spent a, a night at a, a sheep farm, which was really enlightening. We met this couple and they showed us all of their sheep operations and met the dogs. And then a few days later, um, we came across some Maori sheep shearers and they showed us a little bit more about their life. So it was a really great opportunity to meet the people um, and just see what, you know, what New Zealand life is, is about. In terms of trails, you're really happy if you get a day like this with a nice clear trail, space for your head, um, <coughs> flat, more often than not. It's a little bit more challenging than that. Um, this particular forest was just absolutely choked with vines and, you know, it's really amusing for the first hour, you know, you're um, pretending to garrote yourself, but uh, after three hours of that, it's less, less exciting. Sometimes you don't see the trail so much as just sense it, um, and you can just get swallowed up by the foliage. Honestly, I had so many scratches, I had branches breaking off in my hair, it was crazy. Sometimes there's a lot of tree fall and you're like, well, I can either climb over it with my pack or I can get on my hands and knees in the mud and crawl under it, you know, so it's, it's not easy walking over there. Tree roots, that's another common ground surface. But what I did like about it was the simplicity of life on the trail. Um, all I had to do was walk every day. I would gather water from a stream or from, you know, waterfalls like this. You wash in the stream, it's just a really simple way of living. So by Boxing Day, I was about to go into the Tongariro Alpine Crossing. I don't know if any of you have done that section. This is what it looks like on a good day. High volcanic alpine desert, totally stunning. This is what it looked like when I was there. <laughs> yeah, it had its own charm. Walking up to Red Crater there. So, yeah, beautiful. We did about 38 kilometres, I think, that day to get through to Whakapapa. And then it was on to the Whanganui River, which is an official part of the trail. You have to paddle 200 kilometres. There was about 200 rapids to shoot um, in that time. Stunning scenery, absolutely stunning, highly recommended. It's, it's actually one of the New Zealand's great walks, they call it, even though it's not a walk, it's a classic journey. Um, so you've got a lot of waterfalls just bursting out, stunning scenery. And the best bit was I wasn't on my feet and I could like carry some red wine and magazines and 
chisels and all these exotic things. So really enjoyed spending, it was probably about six days to get to Whanganui. <clears throat> and that was my first day back on my feet again, which was, I think I'd just forgotten the pain of being on my feet. Um, yeah, a little bit pooped. So nearly at the bottom of the North Island and going into the Tararua range, which is uh, quite a significant challenge. Uh, a lot of it is right above the tree line, very dense forest to around the bottom. There's it's renowned for being windy because of the, uh, the wind funnels through the North and the South Island. So um, you've got to have good weather for it. So we were carrying about eight days of food going into this section just in case the weather held us hostage. Um, the the low-lying forests were just absolutely covered in, in mosses and, and ferns festooned with water. And then up high, um, it gets a whole lot windier and more exposed. And there was one morning we woke up in a hut and we could hear the wind and we're like, well, is that normal Tararua windy or is that dangerous windy? And we thought, well, we're not going to know until we get up there. So we went up there and found out it was dangerous windy. And honestly, you, you just, the wind sounded like a jet engine in my ears. It was just screaming and it, my eyes were screaming and I couldn't see and it, you'd literally just take a few steps and then sort of hang on to the, you know, hanging on to fistfuls of tussock grass trying to hang on. And then when the, the gusts ease, you'd sort of stagger a little bit more. And I actually got pushed over onto my bum twice, just blown straight over. Uh, it was actually quite surreal. I've just never experienced anything like that before. But eventually we, uh, you know, the, the, the following day the winds passed a little bit and I could the fog cleared and I could see the ranges and um, it's just absolutely stunning. It's not the place you want to be in bad weather, but um, in good weather, <coughs> it's stunning. But as you can see, you feel very small in that kind of environment. And then I reached Wellington, woohoo! Bottom of the North Island. So I regrouped with a couple of hikers that I'd met in the Tararuas and may or may not have had some champagne, I don't know. Um, so it was a celebration halfway there. Um, <clears throat> I was celebrating that, but I was thinking about the South Island to come and I knew that there was going to be some significant challenges there. That's where the mountains are, you know, bigger mountains. Um, that's where there are longer stretches between civilizations, so we're going to be tested a little bit more. It started off easy in the Queen Charlotte track. Um, which is a, a popular short track. Um, it felt like the tropics when we arrived. You know, we had dolphins accompanying us on the, the water taxi here, um, cicadas and birdsong in the trees. I had three days of lovely, easy walking, sort of ridge tops with beautiful views over the Marlborough Sound. So lovely walking there. And there was a bar on route, go figure. Uh, so that was a real treat, just five minutes from our campsite. <clears throat> nice glass of wine. And while we're enjoying a glass of wine, killer whales. Pretty happy about that. So the barman just took us in a little dinghy and just got us out a little bit closer. Not too close, but just close enough to have a, a closer look. And uh, that was pretty magic. And so, you know, it had been a, just such a wonderful introduction to the South Island and as we were staggering back to our tents at night, I thought, well, how, how can anything top this? It's been a fabulous day. And as we're walking back in the dark, we noticed all these little green dots in the trees and it was glowworms everywhere. It was magic. Um, now, in the South Island, there's a lot more rivers to cross. And if you're lucky, you'll end up with a lovely bridge like this one. If you're less lucky, you'll end up with a, a three-wire bridge, which is walking on one bridge and walking on one wire and hanging on to the other two. Now the Richmond Ranges was sort of the first of the big serious challenges in the South Island. So it's at the north of the South Island. It's rugged and the well mark is unformed in places. Some it's consistently above 1,500 metres and the track has many steep exposed sections and stream crossings. So we were hoping for good weather and thankfully we got it because it would have been a whole different world without. But it was still quite challenging with 
no real ground trail to follow and um, a lot of scrambling is quite steep at times which is fine in, in good weather but you know if the visibility starts to go a bit it really ups, ups the stakes a bit. Now when we got to the top of the ridge and I was like great flat ground okay where do we go from here and I um, don't know if I can get this pointer to work no the track is actually just at the bottom of this vertical bit here and I was like you're joking <laughs> wasn't happy and um, you know there was sections where um, I was trying to get some purchase there were some rocks and I was going down there and then the whole rock would start sliding down the hill too it was pretty sketchy but um, that's New Zealand for you lots of sidling the New Zealanders love putting sidling in their trail notes. Um, it sounds so benign, but the, it um, can be fraught with danger sometimes. There's a river crossing on a rock chute just above a four metre waterfall. The water is flowing fast down the chute, and if you lose footing, you'll go over the waterfall. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's just one of many challenges. The track undulates, undulates, that's another word that doesn't sound very dangerous, but um, I don't know if you can grasp the steepness there, uh, but it was just st full on steep up and then straight back down again across rivers, straight back up again, straight back down. It was a pretty exhausting section. But after about a week, we crossed the Richmond Ranges, ticked that off, and then it was straight into Nelson Lakes National Park, which is actually one of my favorite favourite spots. Stunning scenery. Um, there's a backcountry hut there that we stayed in, one of my favourite huts of the whole route. Um, New Zealand's got about a thousand backcountry huts and you can get a pass for like about $90 for six months and then just go nuts, just stay out there. So some of them are no more salubrious than a garden shed and some of them are like this with double glazing and a fireplace and yeah, luxury. So it was hard walking again, but I was just absolutely um, thriving on the views here, just beautiful views. So once again, not easy hiking, not really defined trails, but um, you know, visually very rewarding. There's a lot of sections in New Zealand where you might get an hour at a time of this sort of boulder field and they sort of clink and tilt and it takes a lot of concentration and, and balance to, to maintain your footing. This is Blue Lake, which is actually, it has a visibility of about 75 metres. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to swim in it, so you just have to take their word for it, but it is beautiful to look at. We had to cross um, or traverse around Lake Constance and we'd heard about two weeks before we went through, a British hiker unfortunately fell to his death at this spot. And nobody knows exactly what happened. Um, he was an experienced hiker and he had all the required safety equipment. Um, search and rescue could only speculate as to what happened. You know, was the weather bad? Did he trip and fall? Um, but it just struck a sobering nerve when we knew that we couldn't afford, you can't afford to have a moment's lapse in concentration and uh, on these sorts of trails because things can go very bad very quickly. Um, we had to go walk through this valley and then up and over the YL Pass at the end of it. And I, once again, I was walking through this valley going, well, where the hell does the trail go, you know? Um, it goes up a steep scree slope in a direct fashion, which, <laughs> which just means straight up. Uh, and it was so steep at times, it's like having um, ball bearings on solid ground, you know, and I was really having to dig the toe in and step, step the poles in and make sure that I had a solid footing before I took the next step. Uh, but wonderful views along the way up as well. And eventually we got to the top of the pass and this is the kind of view you get, which I, I just loved it up there. Coming down was another matter. If you remember the map I showed you at the front with the contour lines, this is what it looks like. And it's, it's almost rock climbing to get down. So I was pretty happy to finally reach the bottom of that. So by now we're halfway through the South Island and 
the track just seems to really speed up. In the north, it took a very winding route, but in the south, it was just, you know, relentlessly charging towards the finish, and not, none of us were particularly happy about that. We were having a great time out there. The, mount, the rivers started to get a lot wider and, um, you know, more challenging as we, as we went down. And I remember standing in this spot and thinking, you know, this scene is the sort of scene I saw in the guidebook back home before I started. It's the scene that, you know, rattled the butterflies in my stomach. But as I was standing there, I thought, it, this just feels like home now. You know, this, this uh, I feel like I've, I've got this. As I passed through Arthur's Pass, fresh snow started falling on the peaks. And it was a little nudge that, you know, winter's coming. Better start, you know, walking a bit faster. And it was in sort of the middle of the South Island that I found myself on my own for the first time since I'd been on the, on the beach up north. A few hiking buddies pulled out, one went home, one took a week out to do something or other. And so I was about to go into this eight day section and it was one of the most challenging parts of the whole trail actually. I knew from reports ahead of me, of, you know, from hikers ahead, that I had about 60 river crossings to do in that week there was going to be un, untracked terrain that I'd have to walk through, so there'd be navigational challenges. I heard there was chest-high tussock grass to deal with, and a crossing of the Rangatata River, which is considered a major hazard zone on the route. Um, and when I was reading about this, this river crossing before I left home, you know, they warned about, oh, you know, the river levels can change really quickly, we don't recommend you walk across it. And I'm like, you know, how bad can it be? It's a river, I'll just bolt across it, you know. This river took me two hours to get across. It was about three or four kilometres. And there's all of these separate waterways, so you might cross one, and then you get to the next one, and it could be too deep. Um, so, yeah, it's not to be taken lightly. Anyway, so uh, this was my first night at Commons Hut. Um, and all was going well, it was sunny and warm and I was uh, sh sheltering from the sun <coughs> inside the hut looking out at the mountains. I had a shower, uh, had a shower, had a wash in the river, washed all my clothes and they dried in the space of half an hour, it was so warm. The next morning I headed off on my own again and I'm thinking, yeah, this is going all right. Um, I haven't got myself lost yet and everything's going fine. By the end of the day I could see these rain, rain clouds building and I felt a wall of icy air come towards me and I thought, well, I've only got about half an hour to go to the hut, you know, um, you know, maybe I'll get wet, but how bad can it get? And I, I don't have any photos of what happened next because I was too busy trying to survive. Um, but the rain hit me and there were balls of ice in it and I was like, hail, great. And then about a minute later, that turned to snow, and I was like walking faster and thinking, come on, come on, I'm gonna hurry up and get to this hut. And the wind picked up, and it was just bitter. And my temperature just started plummeting like a stone. My hands went numb, and um, I knew the next hut was, in the words of the uh, trail notes, tucked away up a side stream. So I didn't want to miss it, but the air was just white um, with snow. And my fingers got so numb, I honestly believe you could have chopped them off and I wouldn't have felt them. They were just completely numb. And I was trying to press the buttons on my GPS and I couldn't tell if I was touching it or just pressing it until the screen responded. It was, it was um, kind of crazy. And then eventually I saw the turn off to the hut. I had a couple of rivers to cross. I didn't trust myself to rock hop because my feet were numb as well. And so I just waded through the water and the water felt warm on my feet. And I eventually um, got to the hut. This is a few hours later and you can see all the snow on the peaks. And it, you know, you hear about this all the time about how New Zealand weather can change so quickly, but to experience it firsthand, it was really sobering. Um, when I got to this hut, there was a French guy in there and I couldn't undo the clips on my pack, they were all encrusted with ice and my fingers were numb so he uh, got a fire going and I had some hot soup and things started to look better. So in the morning I went back out and I went to fill my water bottles up in that, in that stream and the, the water was actually painfully cold on my hands. 
the, wa the same water that had felt warm the night before. So it was sobering, but it was really beautiful, and it was another little lesson locked away in my head about how to deal with the New Zealand wilderness. So for a couple of days I walked with this French guy through the Canterbury High Plains, and it was blissfully easy walking because it was nice and flat and you had all the mountains and the pretty stuff on the side. We climbed again and stayed at this hut and the next morning I noticed a lot of fresh snow on the peaks and I'm like, uh, I don't know if I want to keep walking today because we, we were about, we were approaching the highest point of the whole trail, about 1900 metres and um, my buddy was like, nah, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And I'm like, eh. You know, I looked at the clouds and I thought, they look familiar. They look like the same clouds I saw a couple of days ago. And the, the pain was still fresh in my mind. And I was like, do I or don't I go? And it was a bit of a turning point for me because at that point I said, no, I'm not going to go. And it's the first time that I followed my own intuition, my own gut instead of just following somebody to stick with them for company. Um, and as my buddy was lacing up his shoes, it started snowing again, and we both went back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Except I might have come out for a little play later. And then later on in the afternoon, it cleared again, and he was, my buddy's ready to go, and I'm like, no, nah, it's really nice here in the sun. Maybe I'll just like hang out. And then he said, I'll lend you my gloves, and I'm like, done. <laughs> so I really rugged up, I put his gloves on, and out we went. And we did get caught in the snow again, but this time I was bundled up for it and could kind of um, enjoy the, the drama of the, of the wilds. And we made it just far enough to get to Royal Hut, this 100-year-old corrugated iron box in the middle of a high, high valley. And there we stayed for three nights while the wind howled around us and the snow dumped. And um, it's, it's a long time to spend in a hut when the snow is blowing in and gathering in the, in the framework. Uh, very freezing. We just stayed in bed, talked rubbish, um, read magazines from the 1980s that had been left behind in there, um, Nat Geo's and Reader's Digest. Um, on the third afternoon, a couple of friends turned up, the ones that I walked with to Auckland, and they had a radio and we tried to get some cover to see what the forecast was like. And thankfully, this was the next morning and I was like, I am out of here. So I started climbing up to, to Stag Saddle so this is the highest point of the entire trail and it was warm and just beautiful weather and beautiful scenery as well. So we just walked down, that's Lake Tekapo in the distance, signalling the end of that eight day section. And on that last night I camped up high and I sort of reflected on the week that had been and that I'd so much had happened in that week and I'd faced so many challenges but I got through it and it was, it was just a bit of a, a turning point for me. And so I carried on walking on my own now and I'm not worried about being on my own. I camped on the edges of Lake Pukaki and I've got views of uh, Mount Cook there. It took me a couple of days to walk around the edge of that lake and headed into the Ahuriri River Valley which is another really remote section but I had everything I needed. I had water, I had food, I had somewhere to camp. Um, so I was just really enjoying having all that space to myself. I'm just putting my tent up wherever I feel. Still a few more challenging sections, but um, I could deal with it by then. So now I'm almost near the end. Um, it uh, Wanaka here. And there's the Motutapu track connects Wanaka and Queenstown, two ski towns. Really steep mountains here. And um, if you can see on that top picture, the track goes right over the top of that knife ridge. So really exposed. You don't want to be there in strong winds. <coughs> awesome huts on that section. Apparently Shania Twain and her uh, partner own a lot of their stations around here. And so part of the deal was they had to construct all these awesome huts. So thank you, Shania.
Um, it was in one of these huts that I had a bit of an epiphany one night because as I was so close to the end, I was starting to get anxious again about going back to the city and I didn't want to go. You know, I'd been walking for four months and that sort of lifestyle, a, a habit that you practice for that length of time is just becomes a new way of living and I've never been happier than I was with one bag of belongings, one outfit, no makeup, no mirrors, no media, no rubbish and I was lying in bed one night and feeling the anxiety come back and I'm like what is this about? You're in a beautiful place right now and this voice said I'm scared of not being me and I was like well that's it you know I didn't want to go back to my old job in the city I didn't want to write policies and procedures and do risk management plans. And I thought, well, no one's holding a gun to my head. I don't have to do this if I don't want to. And that was just a, a moment for me because um, I realised that I had control of my life. I didn't have to go back to that old life. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that I had control and that sort of shifted my mindset a bit. So the, uh, by now I'm sort of past all of the major mountains, but the beautiful scenery continued right through to the end. Um, started getting colder, there was ice on the berries in the morning, I had to wear my beanie until midday. Um, and the end of the trail seemed like it was rewinding from the start of the trail and went back through mossy forests and back along the long empty beaches. And eventually the last day came, a 30 kilometre road hike from Invercargill down to Bluff and I rendezvoused with the, the guys that I walked with to Auckland and it was a bit of a, a festive moment as we did those last kilometres and finally I finished it and that was that was an awesome day but uh, I mean I was excited about having finished it but I wasn't excited about well what do I do now you know everything from the last year had been gearing up to this moment and then I had to go back to the city and that just seemed crazy. When I got back to the city, it was like walking into a bun fight. You know, there's drama and noise and chaos. And I'm like, whoa, what is going on here? I started seeing billboards like this. And I, I never realized how much emotional energy I wasted thinking about what I'm eating or what my body looks like until it didn't matter anymore. You know, for five months, I hardly looked into a mirror and without Without that, I started worrying much less what I look like or you know how other people see me, and that was a great freedom. I came back to my room at home and I was like, my God, look at all this stuff, you know? Like I just had one outfit and 12 kilos of belongings for, for five months and then suddenly I had all of this gear everywhere and I just realized that I, I didn't need it, so I sold a lot of it. You know, just spare bikes, stuff in the shed, clothes that I haven't worn for ages. I mean, you know, how much of it do we really use? You, you always reach for the old favourites. So I just got rid of things, turned it into cash, recycled it, recirculated it for other people to use. And then my job, that's my old office there on the left and in comparison to the, the life that I had been living. And there was no way I could squeeze myself back into that box in the city. Couldn't do it. So after four months, I had my last day at work in my corporate job and moved to the Solomons. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd always, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to write a book and, um, and be a travel writer and I thought, well, I'm just going to give myself a year out, live as cheaply as I can and try and write this book. So I started off with two months in the Solomons. And I did a couple of hours work a day for this little family run resort um, in exchange for a bungalow and some food. And the rest of the time I worked on my book and had fun. And uh, went snorkeling around the island and seeing all the fish and turtles and sharks. And then after that I went back to New Zealand and I worked at a forest camp, um, sort of like a holiday camp. Did two hours a day of cleaning toilets and stacking firewood in exchange for my own cabin and the rest of the time I hiked and I worked on my book. I met a guy who was sailing around the world on a yacht and I hopped on in Mackay and sailed for seven weeks through the Whitsundays up to Cairns. And then after that I went and hiked 200 and 
30 odd k's in the outback on the Larapinta Trail. I went and hiked another 250 in Victoria. That's a koala up there on the top right there. Um, so I did all the things that I always you know, wanted to do, just more time out in nature. I did a lot of house sitting. So I stayed in other people's houses and looked after their dogs and wrote my book. So I, I had all the benefits of traveling without all the expenses. And I sort of realized that if you don't spend a lot of money, you don't need a lot of money. Um, so whilst, um, you know, when I quit my job, I thought, well, you know, this could cost me money. I didn't actually go backwards because I just led a frugal life. I started also writing um, stories for magazines. So that gave me a little bit of a, a boost in the income as well. And so it's been five years since I quit that corporate job now. And um, I haven't looked back. You know, something that I thought would just be a temporary measure, I've managed to, to follow my dream and follow uh, you know, my gut and do something that I've always wanted to do. And so um, you know, I earn a fraction of what I did in the corporate world, but I'm 100 times happier. And that, to me, is success. You know, just having a smile on my face and doing something that feeds me and that I'm excited and passionate about. So what did I learn from the trip? Well, when you're out in nature and you haven't got the constant stimulation that goes on in the city, um, there's a lot of space in your head and, you know, the answers that you have within you come to the, come to the surface. Um, out there I had, there was nothing to remind me of who I was. I had no clothes, no job, no car, no possessions, um, no familiar relationships, nothing that told me who I was. So my whole identity just dropped away and I could rebuild myself the way that I wanted to be. I try not to let fear get in the way now. Before I started the hike, I was full of fears about what may or may not happen. I, if Belle had not agreed to come with me, I might never have tried. So I'm, I'm grateful that, that she got me as far as she did. Um, yeah, I just find that you know, fear is a bit of a, a waste of energy sometimes. There's more fear in the imagining of something than in the reality of it. So now I just you know, get to a situation and just try and think through it logically and trusting your intuition. When I first started hiking, I would just do anything to stick with other people and I'd just go along with what they were doing. And it may or may not have been the right decision, but now I just, I listen to myself and I do what I think I need to do. And that seems to work. But ultimately it's about, you know, getting on my track. And all of the adventures that I've had over the last five years, they never would have happened if I'd stayed in that safe job in the city. Um, I never would have become a travel writer and an author and achieved the things that I wanted to do since I was a kid if I'd stayed in that office job. So, there we go. <laughs>